I feel honored that I can share with you a small part of this festival night in Sarajevo. Is your impression of encountering the city more or less than what you expected? Well, I was uh, I was here in 2000, roughly, uh, right, at, during, right after the war, and I saw a devastated city. I was scouting a movie, which never got made, but it was about relief camps and all that uh, business in Africa here. It was... Uh, Angelina Jolie played the movie eventually, but I didn't direct it or write it. I came back. I'm very heartened by the, the city's been built up again. It looks good. And uh, it's come back. So that's good. Uh, I can't tell you much more. I just arrived. I'm honored to have received this award and what it means. I realize it comes from the war, comes out of the war. Do you like George Orwell? Do you think Big Brother is watching us? Oh, George Orwell, no. You, the world is definitely become a vision of Orwell's. You know, the surveillance has always been an issue, uh, but it, with the United States' technological superiority, it's reached levels of unbelievable proportion. Everything we do is examinable, and uh, it, makes us, it makes us feel smaller and more insignificant. My government has violated all the rules, has violated all the rules, and not only listening in on its own citizens, but listening in on all people everywhere, including the world leaders. It's very depressing. But we live on, and we try to change things and make them better as we go. I made a movie called Snowden about this issue, and uh, Americans uh, still don't understand quite what Snowden did. I mean, it's important to realize what he brought to the world, that information. Who today actually holds the switch to paraphrase the sentence from your film Snowden? When people will no longer be able to prevent tragedy, when the tyranny will start. On the micro level, we have the recent events in Virginia, where there are casualties, we have a state of emergency. On the macro level, the situation that you mentioned in your film about Putin, where global problems of nuclear arms and tensions are growing between North Korea and the United States. You're, uh, you know, you're asking a very crucial question, and that is, a, we, all, I all, we all want to know the answer, and we'd like to know the truth. I mean, America has the most power, and the most, put it this way, the, the problem is, does America think that it has the unilateral right to do what it wants in the world? Does it feel that it, it can control every situation? Or is there a balance of power? Is there a regional power that can be admitted can America respect the rights of Iran, Russia, China, and North Korea too? I mean, the, the question is, can they and will they? And this is what was behind all these interviews with Mr. Putin to find out how the Russians look at the United States. Mr. Putin was very, I thought, reasonable and, and stated uh, what the Russian perspective was and the importance of keeping regional power. We have to respect the rights of other sovereignty sovereignty of Russia China Iran etc Judo promenio Putin u život Judo changed Putin's life Is there a significant turning point in your own biography Judo you said yeah. Well you know we all learn as we go my life was conservative I grew up my father was very much anti-Russian uh, World War 2 veteran different time he believed in the Cold War I think Life has changed so much, and America has become so powerful, spent so much money on military technology superiority that it's lost a sense of value and what humanity means. I do think that. And I put my film, all my films, to a certain degree, have been an awareness of that increasingly. 
Your films are expressing an artistic responsibility. When you talk about politics, about terrorism, when you campaign against war, against the Vietnam War, when you talk about the triumphalism of history, historical figures about Castro or Allende, or when you take a shot at corporate capitalism, is that more powerful through feature films or through documentaries? Well, that's a very good question, because I've done 20 films, uh, feature films, and I think seven, eight documentaries. I wouldn't do... The documentaries allow you to go right to the point. I did Untold History of the United States, which was very factual, and was about 19... It went from 1880 to 2013. Uh, where the films tell a story, and they are more... In uh, A dramatic feature gives you license not to, uh, to, to tell a story and cut through, cut through. And documentaries do too, but it's a different style completely. Uh, we have actors, stay, you know, you stage a feature film. You, it's a lot more work in many ways, but I love the documentary because it's direct and cuts through, and it's a shortcut. Sometimes. But I'm fascinated by the world around me, and I learn from both. Mr. Snowden, uh, although it was a feature film, taught me a lot. And it was a very, we, we tried to stick as closely as possible to the facts. But, you know, we're dealing with 10 years of life, and it has to be done in two, an hour, two hours and some minutes. The uh, Untold History was 12 hours. The Putin interviews was four hours in real time. But it's all over in a flash. I watched both films today and I really enjoyed it. I didn't even notice that six hours had gone by. And that is the power, the importance of film, its social dimension, an inner power that makes the viewer think. Here, you will be part of the Dedicated to program where four of your films will be screened, two we've mentioned, and there will be two others from your earlier phase, Platoon and Natural Born Killers. But you will have something more than film. You will get to meet the audience. How important for you is the feedback from the audience? It's great to go back and see a movie 20 years later, or a documentary, and sit with an audience and see what they think. So that talking to the audience afterwards is, is, is a pleasure for me. I learn a lot. I'm doing a master class tomorrow or the next day on uh, natural born killers, I believe. And uh, the Putin interviews, you know, this... I, I don't know what I'm saying. I, I'm trying to say that it's important historically that we listen to Mr. Putin because he represents a piece of the world that the United States is not here. We, we don't have good communication with Russia. We don't hear Russia. China, too. It's very important that we listen to other people, and movies, through their ability to communicate, allow us to listen to other countries and what their interests are as best we can. I mean, America has a tremendous film business. We have many movies, and sometimes we're not patient, and we don't listen very closely to other people. Putin says that he's communicated with four American administrations, but that nothing much has changed, whether it be Obama or Bush. Well, that was interesting. He said, uh, listen, uh, I've been through four American presidents. Uh, nothing changes with the president. It's a system that goes on. The system is a unilateral one, a very arrogant, very powerful militarily and seeks to dictate what its policies are all over the world. They are going to run into more and more problems as time goes on. There's no question that the United States cannot tell the world everything to do. We cannot control the world. And it's going to become increasingly rough and rocky as they try to control it. As we can now see with North Korea and, uh, and Venezuela and uh, so many problems, if we allow them to be problems, they're not problems. If we can give up the sense of controlling the world, we would go a long way towards keeping the peace that exists, that should exist in natural harmony. There will always be problems, always, but nothing that will be out of hand. 
You've managed to control Putin in a scene where you turn him into an actor and you give him instructions about how to greet you after your last recording session. Was that a metaphor for the relationship between the human and the political, or...? Listen, I, I think the thing with Mr. Putin, the reason I think it worked was because I treated him with great respect, but as a head of state, and I'm a filmmaker, I'm his equal. Different, we just do different professions. Most reporters, they ask questions, and if you're a Western reporter, generally speaking, you're very hostile to uh, a different point of view. In other words, to be tough, to be tough is regarded as a good quality in America. To be a cowboy, to be a tough guy or woman, and ask him all sorts of provocative questions, he's not going to cooperate, and he's not going to answer that way. I tried to make him speak. I tried to show his mind, show his mind rather than to change his mind. I was not out to get points to be tough. I wanted to encourage him to express himself. And I think I succeeded. Sometimes I challenged him. Sometimes. And at the end, the fourth episode, I think, I pushed it pretty far and questioned his future and what he wants to do as, with the power that he has. I don't find him as powerful as his enemies and critics pointed out to be. I think he's a man very much aware of the balance of things and very aware of his people and wants to serve the Russian people and the interests of the Russian people well. That's his concern. So uh, I, he takes, I don't find that he takes anything for granted. How important are contemporary heroes, as you call Snowden? Last night, with Joshua Oppenheimer, I talked about the genocide in Indonesia, where the member of a family that was killed found courage 50 years later to speak out about this, and the truth was revealed. How much is the world faced with an impossibility to promote such heroes, because politics and secret services are more powerful, and people are afraid, afraid for their own lives, for their existence? Well, this is true. Everything you say is true. The, the state power has gotten stronger. However, the beauty of making documentaries and films, as Mr. Oppenheimer does, is to bring this out. And we've had much more honesty in films, more accessibility, better technology. Filmmakers are in abundance and have been able to penetrate so many countries in Africa, Indonesia, and so, as you said. Stories have come out that we would not have known 20, 30 years ago. So it's very important to keep up the filmmaking activity, to penetrate behind the, the words of the state, the official, the, official, the official words. We have to always look. Making films, documentaries, is very important. And uh, we must keep at it. Uh, and this is why, and people will see more, realize more. They know the power of the state. They know the power of the gun. Everyone does. Uh, and, but we have to make people aware of it all the time and remind them. Sometimes we win, sometimes we penetrate, but often you can't. You can't just get through. Uh, for example, right now America's on the warpath with Russia. And I tried to make some points about listening to Russia, but it's very hard to get that through the American media, which is very controlled by the corporate state. To go back to your art, what is the foundation of your authorial, even philosophical attitude to film? I, uh, Jerry, I grew up very conservative. As I said, I went to Vietnam. And after Vietnam, I learned that the ways of the world are a little bit different than what I thought. And I've grown year by year. I went to Central America during the wars of 1980s. Certainly my head was turned. Uh, and I began to see America as basically an oppressor of social reform, oppressor of social reform against the interests of the working man. Unfortunately, it's continued like this and we've reached a much more corporate world. And I, you know, in a sense, I begin to see the world as a much more difficult proposition. And my job as a filmmaker is more challenging than it was when I started back when I was young. And I thought the world needed to be radicalized. But I think when you get older, you realize how difficult it is to change things. Dugo, dugo se govori, uvijek, uvijek se govori o razlikama između evropskog i američkog filma. 
There has been a lot of talk about the differences between European and American film, independent and Hollywood production. Some European authors wanted to make films here and there to also get a feel for Hollywood. Wim Wenders and Stephen Frears told me about how glad they were to be able to have both experiences, both sides of the Atlantic. What do you think? Is there a difference? Or has globalization wiped away the differences? You're asking me a very difficult question. I would just say that American filmmaking has always been top of the top of the line. Corporate filmmaking. It's always been made by studios, big money is involved. And no matter what you do, you, you have to try to make money with the film. So that changes the nature of how the film is made. Uh, and now with the corporate world even stronger than ever, it's in America it's very difficult to be critical of America, to make a movie that's critical of America. When I made Snowden, for example, we could not get any money from American uh, corporate enterprise, none. The movie was financed essentially from Germany and from France uh, with Russian money as well as uh, European monies, but very little from America. We got eventually get distribution in America, it was not the best, but that's the kind of problems you have. So corporate filmmaking does lead to a dead end, absolutely. We're going to be making bigger and bigger movies, but they're going to be empty. I don't know that the American people are going to benefit from it. I think it's very important. Independent filmmaking continues, low budget, sometimes uh, it, with success, but most often not. The same is true, essentially. In Europe, they never had corporate filming. There was always a sense of the auteur, but those films were never that popular. So we have to somehow find ways to make films that are independent and entertaining at the same time. I've tried to do that. At the end, I'll ask you another question. Did the Child's Night Dream from 1965 come true? Or was Bernie Sanders right when he talked in his campaign about how the American dream is not American but Danish, that more important than the dream is a social welfare state? Oh, you've asked me a very difficult question because Denmark is so small compared to America. Uh, America is on a path which they spend so much money on military and security, it's crazy, the amount of money, crazy, beyond belief. And they don't do a very good job of it, in my opinion, because they, they waste a lot of money. So it, with uh, Denmark, I wish, could be a model of efficiency. And, uh, you know, America should have a social net for, for everyone. But uh, it's political, it's difficult. To be the leader of America is not easy. Uh, and, uh, you know, my country, I, I worry. I worry for it. But I'm optimistic, too, I hope. And I think people like who keep talking about these things, Europe plays a very important role here. Europe is in, can bring a better future because they're aware of these social problems. I hope that the dream of the child from your book that you wrote in 1965 does come true, but I believe that you are already living the dream. Thank you for this interview, and I would wish you a pleasant encounter with the Sarajevo audience. Over 3,000 people will come to celebrate the fact that you will be receiving the honorary heart of Sarajevo, just like this little one I have here on my jacket. Thank you once again. Well, thank you, Jerry. Very nice of you. Thank you. Okay.